I'd like to talk to you about the place of marriage in our culture today, which of course is a pretty hot topic, and I'll break my uh, talk down into uh, three parts, three headings. I'd like to talk to you about the unreal and distorted relationship our culture has with marriage now. The unreal and distorted relationship. Secondly, what the underlying beliefs and attitudes are that are causing this distorted, unreal relationship. And then thirdly, where uh, the Bible and the gospel can help our culture. What, what the Bible says that could really resolve this. So first of all, when I say the unreal and distorted uh, relationship of our uh, our culture to marriage. I can be brief, but I also want to be real specific. Here are three statistics, facts, that the divorce rate today is about 50%. About 50% of marriages end in divorce. In 1960, and that didn't seem like a very long time to me, but anyway, in 1960, it was, uh, the divorce rate was half that. Here's a second one, which I think is extremely important. In 1960, 75% of all U.S. adults were married. Today, it's less than 50%, which is a huge change. And then thirdly, as many of you know, in 1960, the percentage of people who cohabited, uh, men and women living together apart from marriage, without being married, uh, that percentage was negligible. It wasn't really on the map. Today, uh, one quarter of all unmarried women, ages 25 to 40, are living with a partner, living with a man. And over half of all women in their 20s, 30s, and 40s will at one time cohabit. And the, um, those statistics are, are, are striking. The change is really big in the culture. The statistics also show a, a set of assumptions on the, that are pretty pervasive out there. A set of assumptions. And here's what one, some of the assumptions are. One is that if, well, one of them is that most marriages are unhappy. And you can sort of see why people would think that. They say, well, now wait a minute, if 50% of all marriages divorce and in divorce anyway, surely a certain percentage of the others that survive aren't happy, and therefore most marriages are unhappy. Um, a second assumption is that living together, living together before you get married, is a great way to figure out whether it's the right person, especially if you've got the right sexual and romantic chemistry, which is understood as the key to other things. That if you have the right sexual and, and, and uh, romantic chemistry, that's what you have to find in living together figures, you know, helps you understand whether that's there, especially if it's there in a, in a kind of enduring way. Another um, assumption is that the key to satisfying marriage is finding that perfectly compatible soulmate. And that is defined, and you can see it actually, Kathy and I noticed, for example, on eHarmony, there was a, an ad this way, uh, the, the, the perfectly compatible soulmate that people out there are looking for is someone who won't change me, somebody who accepts me just as I am, Somebody who will affirm me, not change me, and release me to be myself, and not shackle me. Now, these assumptions show a real fear of marriage, a real negative attitude toward marriage, a real insecurity about marriage. And yet, here's another set of facts. These are also empirical facts, and listen to this. First, those who live together before marriage are more likely to get divorces than those who do not. In other words, if you cohabit before you get married, you're more likely to divorce. Secondly, in general, the earlier that sex is introduced to a relationship, the more likely that relationship is to break up. Thirdly, yes, it's true that divorce rate is 50%, but the greatest percentage of divorces happen to uh, people under the age of 18, there's quite a lot of that, and people who haven't completed high school, and therefore if you complete your high school and college and you get married in your early or mid-20s, your chances of getting divorced are much, much, much less than 50%. And, listen to this, two-thirds of all marriages that say they're unhappy, if they stay together five years later, they say they're happy. Two-thirds. And also, over the last 40 years, in general, 62% of all people who are married said they were very, not happy, but very happy with their marriage, and that's, those numbers have stayed up. Uh, and of course, you probably heard these, and that is there are piles and piles of data that say that married people have a far higher level of physical health, mental health, wealth accrual at every age, and children who grow up with two married parents all their lives have a two to 300% more likely chance of positive life outcomes. You've heard that. In other words, here's my, my, my first point's over. I'm done with my first point. What's the first point? The first point is that even though our culture has tremendous fears about marriage, tremendous uh, uh, lack of uh, belief in marriage, constant calls for saying marriage has had it, the, empirical, the reality is that marriage is still the best thing possible for you if you can get it. 
is a great thing. So why this unreal and distorted view of marriage? If it's not based in reality, and it isn't, why are people so negative and afraid of it? Why are they putting it off? Why are they failing to do it in such huge numbers? Point two. There are a couple of underlying attitudes, and here's the main thing. Essentially, there's been a change in our culture to the understanding of the purpose of marriage. There's been a change with regard to what is understood as the purpose of marriage. The biblical idea, and by the way, to some degree, other traditional cultures align with this, but the biblical idea of marriage is that marriage is something that creates a framework for lifelong devotion of love between a man and a woman, or let me break that down. Basically, the purpose of marriage is it's a framework to do three things, at least. First of all, it's designed to help each party subordinate their individual impulses uh, and interests in favor of the family, the relationship, and growth in character. See, one of the purposes of marriage is making it very, very difficult to get out. And therefore, what's more important than my happiness at the moment is the marriage, is the relationship. In other words, you, you subordinate individual interests and you subordinate your individual impulses for the good of the marriage, the relationship, and it creates character over time. That's one of the designs. Another design is that men and women are so deeply different, and yet they clash, and yet they mesh. Their differences make them clash. On the other hand, their differences make them mesh, and, and marriage is a way of bridging that gap and really creating an interlockedness and bringing a male and female together with their different views of life and their different insights, their different gifts, and their different weaknesses together into a whole, and then thirdly, designed to create a long-term, stable, secure setting for raising children. In other words, marriage is a public good. It's a marriage that's good for human character development. It's a marriage that's good for uh, relationships between genders. It's a mar marriage is a good thing for raising children, and so forth. However, what's happened, John Witte, who's a, a, uh, a scholar, he's a historian, basically he's a social historian, and he put it perfectly like this. Here's the change, quote, he says, the older ideal of marriage is a permanent contractual union designed for the sake of mutual love, procreation, and protection is slowly but surely giving way to a new reality of marriage as a terminal sexual contract designed for the gratification of the individual parties. That's it. In other words, at one point, marriage was subordinate me to us, subordinate me to the public good, subordinate me even, even by my immediate interest, to my long-term character development subordinate me to all these other things. But today what's happened is, very, very overtly, marriage is about me. In fact, Tara Parker Pope, uh, last year, when was this? No, 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 I forget, two years ago maybe, wrote this fascinating article in the New York Times, so out there, and just expressed what we all know has happened in the culture. Uh, Tara Parker Pope wrote, it's called The Happy Marriage is the Me Marriage. And here's what she said, New York Times, I think two years ago. The notion that the best marriages are those that bring satisfaction to the individual may seem counterintuitive. After all, isn't marriage supposed to be about putting the relationship first? Not anymore. For centuries, marriage was viewed as an economic and social institution, and the emotional and intellectual needs of the spouses were secondary to the survival of the marriage itself. But in modern relationships, people are looking for a partnership, and they want partners who make their own lives more interesting, who help each of them attain valued goals. Therefore, final quote, marriage used to be about us, but now it's about me. That's it. That's a huge, huge change. Now, the irony is, if that's, the, if that's what's happened, the purpose of marriage is not for me to make a sacrifice, certainly not to change. I've got to find someone who is perfectly compatible, and that means somebody who accepts me as I am, somebody who affirms me, somebody who helps me get to my goals, that's the perfectly, and also somebody who, with whom I have this great sexual romantic relationship because the whole purpose of marriage is fulfillment, personal, individual self-fulfillment. And if that doesn't work, if that's not what's, what's ahead of me, I'm not going to that marriage. And if I'm in a marriage and it stops happening, then I'm out. Here's the problem, and this is the weird, and this is my main point. That approach puts more pressure on marriage than the Bible puts on it or any traditional culture has ever put on marriage. It puts tremendous pressure on marriage. It says marriage has to provide something that no, the Bible doesn't say it should provide, and nobody else has ever said it should provide until, to not, until now. Why? Because here, think. Who do you have to find for a, marriage, a me marriage? Class? Who do you have to find? First of all, somebody 
who doesn't think there's anything wrong with you hardly. <laughs> because they, you, can't, they don't, you don't want them to come in and change you. Okay? But that means, of course, that you've got to find somebody that you don't particularly want to change much either. There shouldn't be a great deal of conflict and there has to be this desire constantly to jump into bed. It has to be absolutely, completely natural. I've got a lot of statistics that say it's exactly what everybody says they have to be. Do you realize what that means? No wonder nobody can find anybody like that because there's nobody like that out there. <laughs> Secondly, no wonder there's a lot of cohabitation because people say, well, at least I'd like to have sex with somebody, but I don't want to give myself to someone like that unless there's going to be, they have to be totally no, low maintenance. They've got to be constantly not trying to change me. But let's just say this. If you put on top of the culture's view of marriage, which is self-fulfillment, compatibility, soulmate, don't change me, and on top of that, you try to make it virtuous by saying, oh, and I want to marry a Christian too. <laughs> In other words, if you've imbibed the, 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 the values of the culture, and what you say, if you're a man, but there's not too many of you out there right now, but if the men say, oh, I want to marry a Christian, but she's got to be absolutely gorgeous, and she can't change me, and if the women just pick up what the culture says, I want to marry a guy, but he's got to really be quite a provider. He's got to really have a great job. You know, got to really, you know, I got to really know I'm going to be living pretty nicely and be able to raise children and have no problem sending them to private school and all that stuff. In other words, if you imbibe the culture's um, incredibly self-centered me marriage, and then you put on top of it the me marriage concept, and then you put on top of it, oh, and I want to marry a Christian, you're never going to find anybody. Or if you do, and you get married, and as soon as you find it, it's incredibly hard, really hard, you're going to say, I married the wrong person. What can, oh dear, I mean, it, you know, of course, some of you know, because I put it in the book, and some of you, it seems like a lot of you read the book. Um, the reality is that marriage is difficult. It is hard. No two people are ultimately compatible, because all human beings are sinners, including Christians, which means they're self-centered. That means when you bring any two self-centered people, still deeply self-centered, even after they believe the gospel together, there's, it's going to be very, very difficult. Plus, you've got the fact that men and women are different, and that was, that's part of the point of marriage, is to bring people together who are somewhat uh, mysterious to each other. You really don't understand why they think that way. And when you put the gender difference, and you put the self-centeredness, and you put all the other natural things together, marriage is actually pretty hard to get to learn how to fit. Stanley Hauerwas, Duke University, this is a classic uh, statement. He says, the assumption is that there is someone just right out there for you to marry, and that if you look closely enough, you will find that just right person. This assumption overlooks a crucial aspect to marriage. It fails to appreciate the fact that you always marry the wrong person. <laughs> we never know who we marry, we just think we do. Or even if we first marry the right person, just give it a while and he or she will change. For marriage, being the enormous thing that it is, means you're not the same person after you've entered it. See what he's saying? As you look at this prospective person, you say, ah, this person is characterized by X, Y, and Z. Great, marry. And all of a sudden, it's X, Y, Z, and A, B, C, and D, E, F, because you're in there. You're in the person's life. Marriage is so big that the minute you enter it, you change the person. So he says the primary challenge of marriage throughout the course of marriage is learning to love and care for the stranger you often find yourself married to. <laughs> now he's overstating it, he even admits it, by the way, he's trying to get your attention. There is such a thing as compatibility. You probably shouldn't be 40 years apart. You probably should at least be able to speak the same language. Uh, and I mean, I'm laughing, I'm, I'm pushing the envelope, but then you have to say, well, there's other, th of course there's things that could be getting in the way. You don't want to make the normal incompatibilities, the gender difference, uh, the, uh, the temperament differences that are always there, as well as the basic self-centered sin difference. You don't want to aggravate that unnecessarily. So it is a bit of an exaggeration, but not much of one. And here's what the, here's what the Bible gives us that the culture desperately needs to understand, the understanding of love as a covenantal thing. Let me just take my last couple of minutes on this. Love is a covenantal thing. The essence of a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the way it's covenantal language. God is the witness of the first marriage. You know, he gives, he gives the, the woman to the man. Now, wh wh what is a covenant? Well, our culture doesn't even know. It, we don't even use the word, but here, here's a little nutshell definition. Covenant is an incredible, unbelievable, and for our uh, society, counterintuitive understanding merger of love and law together. That is, a covenantal relationship, relationship is more intense and personal and intimate 
than a merely contractual relationship or legal relationship, but at the same time, it's far more binding and solemn than a merely emotional relationship. In fact, a covenant relationship is more intense and more personal because it's legal. See, when someone says, well, you know, I, why do I have to be married? Why do I need a piece of paper to love somebody? I'll tell you why. Unless you know this other person has really said, I'm committed to you, I'm committed to you for my whole life. I'm committed, and here's what a covenant is, not just to feel loving to you, but to be loving, to be tender, to be faithful, to, be, uh, to serve you, regardless of how I feel. That's a covenant. I'm going to be tender. I'm going to be affectionate. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be unselfish. That's what you're promising when you get married. I promise not to feel loving, but to be loving, regardless of the circumstances. And only when somebody does that to me, then I can say, now I can be myself. Now I'm not afraid that you're going to walk away because we don't have the right chemistry. It's more intimate because you finally can let down your, you can take, well, you, you can even stop fooling yourself as to who you are. And you finally start to find out who that person really is that you have married. I mean, in other words, a covenant, first of all, reveals us so that we can actually be who we are inside the marriage. That can never happen in cohabitation because each person knows they're basically still in marketing and promotion. You've got to constantly say, well, this person is going to leave unless I'm constantly living up. You can't let you. You can never be seen without your makeup. But it's not just that. Covenantal love also actually gives us a richer understanding of what love really is. When Kathy and I first kissed and hugged and held hands years ago, there was this electrical thrill. And somebody says, well, when you hold her hand now, do you get the same electrical thrill you had when you first told, touched her? And the answer is, heck no, thank goodness. <laughs> and, he, and, here's, and here's the reason why. In fact, I, I wrote this down, and I'm reading this because it's very important to say it just the way I think, I think this captures it. Yeah. <laughs> As I look back on it, when we first held hands before we were married, the initial thrill was not so much from the magnitude of my love for her, but from the flattery of her choice of me. The reason, it, the reason you get that thrill is not so much, oh, I'm really loving this person. No, it's your ego. Somebody I like, somebody I think is pretty cool or hot or whatever your, your terminology is, <laughs> is responding to me. That's not love, that's ego. Or what screw tape tells you. If you read the screw tape letters, he says, Most, an awful lot of what human beings call love is really hunger. It's, a knee, it's an ego emptiness. And when you feel like this person is affirming me, this person's actually making me feel better about myself, oh my goodness, you call that love, that's not love. It's, it's, love's in there, but it's largely ego. No, love is sacrificial service and the delight you increasingly find in someone that you've invested your life in. By the way, you notice it happens with children. You know, a little child, you have a child, infant. How much does that infant give to you? Nothing. How beautiful is the infant? Well, you know, if you're a woman, you've got hormonal reasons why you think it's beautiful, but for the rest of us, you say, it's just sort of a little, you know, the Pillsbury Doughboy, you know. And yet, what do you do? You have to, you have to sacrifice that child right away. You sacrifice everything. Your whole life kind of goes away. Uh, the child doesn't give you much. You give and you give and you give and you give, and after a while, you love that child in a way. You love that child industrial strength, love, unconditional love. It's astounding. Why? Because that's what real love is. Real love is sacrificial, sacrificial service, and then the increasing delight that comes from someone that you've invested your life in. And that's the reason why over the years what happens is the love we feel now, considering that we know who we are, in, at first you feel like I'm falling in love with this person, you're falling in love with your idea of what that person, who that person is, not the real person. As years go by, you find out who you are, as years go by, you both find each other's flaws, you get totally disillusioned with each other. Then what happens is you kind of rebuild your respect for each other because you see each person holding on, taking hold, giving up, trying harder, moving on through, embracing, repenting, forgiving, showing grace to each other, and slowly real love grows. And slowly you begin to admire that other person for what she's been through for you and vice versa. And you know, in the end, that's the most sexy thing of all. You know what, you know what is really sexually uh, intense? Is when someone you admire admires you. The praise of the praiseworthy is above all rewards. And with that person you admire, regardless of what they look like, if you just admire that person because of what you've been through and what she's done for you, what you've done for her, it's sexy. It's sexy. In the end, of course, what I've just said about marriage and covenant is something that a lot of other traditional cultures 
believe in too. In some ways, traditional cultures are really more like uh, Christianity than they are like modern Western culture, and yet in the end, Christianity gives, them some, gives us something that the other cultures can't give. Where do you get the power to do this? Where do you get the power to forgive? Where do you get the power to keep loving even when you find out this other person isn't anything like what you wanted them to be? What do you, how do you keep going when you disillusion yourself? When marriage brings out the worst in you and you realize that I am a far worse person than I ever thought. I had no idea I was capable of this kind of anger. I had no idea that I was capable of this kind of lying. I mean, marriage will bring out the worst in you. That's when you have to say, Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, looked down at us, saw us betraying him, denying him, abandoning him, and in the greatest act of love in the history of the world, he stayed on the cross. He didn't love us because we were lovely. He loved us to make us lovely. And when I realize what he did for me, I can look at my wife and she can look at me and she can say, I see you and you've hurt me, but I can cover it. I can forgive it because Jesus Christ looked into my heart and I caused his death and yet he forgave me. And we've got the power of grace to make marriage into what it can be, which is the greatest relationship possible apart from our relationship with God. And so we pray, Kathy and I, that uh, you will take that gospel and use it in your life in that way. Now, Kathy's going to come up and speak to another thing. Uh, and my wife and I have, uh, we went to Gordon Conwell together. We both had the theological training, very important. It's actually, it really helps a great deal to our theological fellowship over the years. And it is true that Kathy is, Kathy and Tim have written all the books that only Tim's name is on. But right now, Kathy comes up and speaks in her own voice and stands on a stool, if I can find it. Here it is. Where is it? Well, we don't share his height. <laughs> Boy, you are invisible out there. Here's something I've been taught since I first became a Christian. What, what, put this closer? Okay, okay. Something I've been taught since I first became a Christian, that as members of Christ's body, we are the hands and feet of Jesus in this world, ministering grace to a broken and needy people. You've heard that too. I'm sure you've heard that. The scripture makes sure that we understand this is not just a nice metaphor, but a genuine reality. I sense an echo. Should I be moving this? Oh, that's the way it is. The echo is there. Saul, when Saul encounters the risen Christ on the Damascus road, and Jesus' question to him is, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? In attacking and killing the Christians, Jesus himself was feeling attacked and persecuted, or at least that seems to be the clear implication. Paul, after years of meditating on that initial encounter in 1 Corinthians 12, comes up with that whole long passage about um, we're all the body, members of the body. And he concludes with, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And there are lots of other passages too in the New Testament, like Ephesians 4 that draw on the body of Christ language. We're supposed to speak the truth in love to one another because, this is Ephesians 4, last uh, verse in the chapter 25, for we are all members of one body. So my point is that the world sees us and we are Christ made visible. And I want to take that one step further. Christian marriage is an apologetic vehicle that is a visible window into the character and life of Christ, his work and his salvation, and something which could astonish the world if we did it right. Just as an aside, I can't see all of you, but I can guess that there are some of you out there who are not currently married or who may be in marriages that are unequal and not particularly happy. You're not going to be left behind. Uh, we'll get to it. Wait for it. Um, everybody gets to be part of this. When you go to college and you sign up for Religion 101, like I did under the belief that I was going to learn about how to be a better Christian, you're told that we've created an anthropomorphic God, one who looks like a human being, talks and acts like one, and that we ascribe things to him out of our own experience. We have fathers, so he is the father, capital F. And we have spouses, so he is the bridegroom, capital B. And so on. Any quality we ascribe to God is because we're cutting and pasting it from our own experience of father-son relationships, of wrath, of love, of shepherds. Not that we have a lot of shepherds, probably, today. But we're told that we've created a God in our own image. C.S. Lewis saved my brain in college and gave me the greatest ammunition in the world by turning this entirely on its head. If God is the creator, which means he was there first, before us, before the world, he was able to make a world any way he wanted to and to fill it with creatures and relationships of any nature he wanted to. So wouldn't it make sense for him to populate our world with things that he would be able to call on when it was time to reveal truths about himself so he would have the metaphors and the images to hand 
Since he's unknowable in his transcendence, we know him only by what he's revealed to us through his written word and through his enfleshed word, Jesus. But what's written, the revelation that's written, draws on analogical language made possible by God's prior creation of things like fathers and sons and brides and grooms and sheep and shepherds and so on. So in order to reveal truths about himself, this helped me so much to get through college, God has given us a world full of show and tell. Well, of course, now we have Jesus, we have the very image of God, and the written word illuminates the incarnate word. But what about the part of God's world that never picks up a Bible, or to whom Jesus is just a curse word you use when you hit your thumb with a hammer? The heavens are telling the glory of God, and sometimes people are moved to listen. But there's another way in which the character and the gospel of God can be visible before a needy world using a vehicle handpicked by God to deliver that information. And I'm speaking about the way in which the distinct roles of men and women in a marriage reveal the gospel of Jesus. Here's my main point. I'm indebted to Jennifer Chan, a deaconess at our church. I met with her and we were talking this, that, this, that. And I finally said what I'm going to say to you. I said to her and she said, that's the main point of your whole book. Why didn't you put that sooner? Why didn't you say more about that? This, this is the best part of your book, which it was too late to rewrite, so anyway. <laughs> but I decided I would make it the main point of what I'm going to talk about. If you take away nothing else, just remember this. In a Christian marriage, each person gets to play the Jesus role. Together, a husband and a wife living out their roles of headship and submission can display the fullness of the glory of Christ and the gospel in a powerful way. In Philippians 2, we're told about Jesus and his submission to the Father, dying for our salvation and rising to greater glory. In Ephesians 5, we're told about Jesus and his headship of the church, exercising his authority by being a servant in order to provide his bride with whatever is necessary for her growth and perfection. For the sake of this discussion, I'm going to assume that we all here agree that the Bible is the only rule of faith and practice, God's voice to us in areas in which he wants us to be happy and therefore obedient. I think I'm on safe ground there so far. Let me go a step further and assume that we all agree that when God created us male and female to reflect his image and stamped every cell in our bodies XX or XY, he meant something important by that. Namely, that by inhabiting different gender roles, we would reflect the life of the triune God in a way that unisex persons could not. In all honesty, I know that can't possibly be true for everyone, and for some of you that will require a certain suspension of disbelief. But if you will grant me that for a few minutes, I'd like to talk about the gift to us and to the world that divinely ordained gender roles are meant to be. Headship and submission, those nuclear words, turn out to both be descriptors of Jesus. And although the sinful hearts of men and women have taken those concepts and twisted them, if we discover and embrace Jesus' definitions, we'll find ourselves entering into the mystery of the dance of the Trinity, as well as enacting the mystery of the gospel. Now, an aside, this is a sidebar here. In fact, it's written on the side of my notes. Um, if I had time, and the time is rushing away, then I would be more than willing, I would be happy to rant against the oppression and the marginalization of women throughout the ages, and especially in the church. This is real, and it's grievous. It's a grief to God, and it's a grievous loss to the body of Christ to amputate many of the most functional members of the body. But I will confine myself to more positive formulations in the interest of time, but like I said, happy to rant. I mean, you have the baby, you have the bathwater, okay? And there are many people I've met whenever I had this discussion. I do seminars on it and talks on it, and I talk to every weeping woman in Redeemer who discovers that we don't ordain women. Comes my way. I always end up saying, look, let's keep the baby, and I will help you bail the bathwater. There's dirty bathwater here. There's a lot of dirty bathwater. Let's get rid of the dirty bathwater, but can we keep the baby? Can we keep the divinely ordained gender roles and get rid of all the twistedness that's been entered into it? Okay. I'm ranting, and I said I was going to stop. Um, <clears throat> anyway, more, we will be embodying, being the body of Christ before the world that needs to see him and see the gospel and his salvation, yet has precious few opportunities to do so. But wait, you say, there's a church on every corner. Anybody's free to walk in to the church, and then there's Christian TV, and there's Christian radio, and there's Christian books and blogs, and people on the street corner with megaphones and leaflets and whatever. Yes, but only in a marriage, and only because God created marriage 
in order to be a vehicle for this revelation, are people able to see repentance and forgiveness operating without manipulation, and the Holy Spirit supporting and sustaining our fumbling attempts to overcome the sins of dominance and overdependence. Your marriage can become a window into the gospel and into a restored and redeemed human society. Our gender roles can also lead to a deeper understanding of ourselves and a deeper understanding of the joy and love and deference and exaltation of the inner life of the triune God. Think about your friends, your families, and your neighbors. They see your marriage and how it works or how it doesn't work much more intimately than anything else you probably do. Tones of voice, shrugs, hugs, Supportive words, apologies, belittling comments, or comments of admiration and praise, all of this is visible even to casual observers. So ask yourself, what should people be able to tell about the gospel of Jesus Christ by looking at your marriage? Since God intended it to be a metaphor, what should they be able to tell? In the headship of a husband, they should see the servant leadership spoken of in Ephesians 5, which I will read part of. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing her with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Christ gave himself up, he died, to make his bride holy and spotless. That's the definition and the model of headship that husbands are given. It doesn't sound much like the Archie Bunker definition of headship, or sadly, the one that you hear from many teachers and preachers who should know better. Being the head in a marriage does not mean that you are qualified to get all the perks and all the privileges and the little woman is around to supply them. In Matthew 20, Jesus said to his disciples, this is starting at verse 25, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. So now he's going to redefine authority, okay? Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The night before his death, Jesus re-emphasized his redemption of power and authority by washing his disciples' feet, that's John 13, vividly showing that he, their Lord and Master, was exercising his authority by being a servant, and so they were obligated to act in the same way. Jesus took the ego and the self-centeredness out of authority and redefined it as the capacity and the desire to serve, even to die, in order to bring about the happiness and the holiness of his church his bride, his people. And sidebar, even though I'm focusing on marriage here, bear in mind that the church is the household of God, so the authority of elders or leaders needs to be the same kind of sacrificial servanthood, the people who do the scut work, the long hours, the boring, painful meetings. But I digress. What about the submission of a wife? Well, I'm tempted simply to say that if you have a husband who understands his headship, then there can be no anxiety about submitting to a man who's willing to die for you in order to serve you. But let's not leave it there. If we look at Jesus in Philippians 2, this is what we read. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and on heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus' submission leads directly to God being glorified. Keep that equation in your mind. The son's equality as God was without question, but he took on the role of a servant. This is crucial to understanding gender roles or to any discussion of gender roles. They're roles, roles, okay, roles. Ever anyone been in the military? One of the first things they teach you is you salute the uniform, not the man or the woman in it, okay? The role of the father and the son are ontologically, or not the role, the being of the father and the son are ontologically equal. There's your $20 word for the day. Ontological means in their essence. In their essence, the Father and the Son are equally God. But the submission of Jesus to the Father in taking the role of a servant in order to be our Savior was a role he assumed willingly. 
that he, it meant that he assumed a role that was economically subordinate, and economically here doesn't mean anything to do with stocks and interest rates, it means in order to accomplish a task. His submission was not compelled or required of him. Would you please notice that? It was a gift for the purpose of securing our salvation. And women who choose to be submissive to the gender roles God has assigned are offering that submission to God first, not to their husbands, for the purpose of creating a marriage that nourishes, enriches, and reveals. When I first wrestled with this passage, my conclusion was, well, if submission did not injure the dignity and equality of the second person of the Trinity, then it's not likely to hurt me. And I have actually kept that as kind of a mantra that I pull out when those weeping women come to me. Where are we with time? Okay, I'll risk it. Um, I would go over a lot of passages if I had more time. I'll go over a couple of them, which I hope you're already familiar with. It talks about azer, the word used for helpmate in Genesis 2, being a very strong word, mostly used of God in the Old Testament, as in, oh God, our help, that God is re recalled our helper, the same way Eve is called Adam's helper. Or in Galatians 3, 26 to 28, that much misinterpreted passage. Most people go to 28. First, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Ah, no more gender roles. Start out with 26. You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is not a challenge to divinely created gender roles, but a window into how God uses them as a vehicle of revelation. You'll notice that first Paul calls us all, men and women, sons of God. That's good, because being a son in that culture meant something that being a daughter didn't. And it's also okay, because later on we are all also men and women called brides and Christ. God is very even-handed in the way he spreads his gender-based metaphors around. He uses a, he calls us sheep, too, and I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I won't go into all the theological and scriptural impoverishment we face if we become just children of God. That's not really false, but it's also not able to carry the weight of all that it's meant to be a son. And then when he says we're all sons, Jew, Greek, male, female, slave, free, no one's worth resides in the role in which they inhabit in life. God regards us all as he does his own son and makes us co-heirs with him, and yet the roles don't disappear. I wanted to spend some time on this, although I know we're pressed for time, because the distinguishing of roles from gifts and both from value untangles one of the naughtiest problems in discussing gender roles anytime the subject comes up. To wit, and to recap, men and women are equal in value and status before God, as we've just seen. Men and women are equally gifted by the Holy Spirit. When it fell at Pentecost, men and women equally displayed the gifts of the Spirit, probably so much so that the early church adopted a unisex, genderless-based role of ministry, which Paul actually, in 1 Corinthians 11, had to rein in a little bit and say, no, the gender roles still stand. Yes, the Holy Spirit's given everybody gifts. They need to be used. But there was a point in God making you male and female. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. He didn't use those exact words, but that's what he meant. Men and women are equally called to use those gifts, but in differing roles. Yet both are the Jesus role. Both men and women get to play the Jesus role in their marriage. Jesus in his sacrificial servanthood, washing his disciples' feet, washing with his blood the sins of his bride. Jesus in his submission to his Father as a gift, not something compelled from him, joyfully, who is in turn lifted up to a higher glory. I said at the beginning that those of you who are not currently married or who are not married to a man who is imitating Jesus in your marriage are not going to be left out of this drama. John Newton said that the biggest danger of a happy marriage is idolatry. We forget our true spouse because our heart settles on our visible human spouse. So single Christians or Christians who are unhappily married because both can be deep wells of loneliness are uniquely placed to remind those of us who are married that we are all betrothed to our heavenly bridegroom. A number of years ago, I had a conversation with one of the deaconesses at Redeemer, and we both together had an aha moment. She said that she felt that the church had no idea, and by church, since we were talking, she kind of meant me, of the pressure being put on a 30 or 40 or older single person by the world that's telling you that you are a fool not to be having sex or at least buying a vibrator. 
I said to her, somewhat at a loss for anything more profound, <laughs> well, Jesus was an unmarried man with a human body, so I'm sure he knows what you're going through. Then it dawned on us both that Jesus still has his human body. It's glorified, it's resurrected, it's perfected. But he didn't just endure 33 years of temptation and chastity, longing for his bride. He's still in his human body, waiting for the day where the consummation of the marriage supper of the Lamb. He knows what you're going through when you are remaining chaste and pure for his sake. That thought needs to drive all of us, single and married, to yearn for that day and to prepare for it. Single people are placed uniquely to remind and correct us married people when we place too much of our happiness in the current circumstances and not enough in our union with Christ. Married people are placed to enact the roles of Jesus so the world sees him voluntarily sacrificing himself for the love of his bride, stepping out of the joys of heaven into the role of a servant, and having paid the bride price on the cross, being exalted above all other names. Everybody gets to play the Jesus role. I'm supposed to close in prayer and remind you that the next session starts in 15 minutes after a stretch break with Don Carson back here promptly at 1.15. So let me close in prayer and then I'll give that announcement, which I just gave sort of out of order. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Bridegroom, brother, friend, there are so many ways in which you describe yourself using the metaphors that you put into this world so that you would be able to reveal truths about yourself that couldn't be revealed any other way. We ask you to use us, use our relationships, use our marriages, Lord, or use our not being married to be a window into the gospel, into the salvation that Christ has won for a world that doesn't read their Bibles listen to sermons, doesn't know about you, and needs to so desperately. We ask this so that your name would be exalted above every other name and that you would be glorified. And we long for the day when we will be united with you. In Jesus' name.